had one particular moment where we were discussing uh, like what defines the feminine and uh, and women like in the group were saying that is not a biological trait what defines the feminine is like a, is a posture like in, in life of posture of resistance and um, and then somebody said well but how do we is it a posture is it an energy and and at some point the community could not define the, the feminine and then a gay man said how can you not define it i feel it in my body it's like <laughs> So this is like a really like a really like memorable moment where there was like this like a silence in the air and nobody could define it and then he raised his hand and said, but I feel it how can you not define it I feel it <laughs> and um so this like has been like a like a, I think people do leave and they say that somehow they became a different person after after this experience there are some prof good professional stories as well. People who like we have this Asian, like a Japanese descent lady who was part of the, the community, and then she did a class on um, Ernesto Neto, who is one of the Brazilian artists that works a lot with like indigenous knowledge and indigenous spirituality, and and then and teach other classes like on the feminine on technology, and and then I asked her, but Silvia. Like you're an engineer, you're a partner in an engineering company. What's the point of like being studying art for you? And she said, I'm very pragmatic. I studied because I feel the use of it in the everyday, the day to day life. When I study art, that somehow makes me more sensitive and makes me more prepared to put myself in the person who I'm talking to shoes and understand where it comes from and what's his vision of the world. And then when I'm taking a brief to do an engineering project, this brief is a lot more precise because I understand the individual I'm talking to. So I'm only studying art because I'm very pragmatic and I see the results on the day-to-day -day life in my engineering practice. And uh, so there is some, some, some great stories that, uh, that we see. So my story with reimagining education is has been this project called uh, Arca, where we kind of we we co-create knowledge together with the community. So I talk a third of the time. I give like a brief introduction to the artists we're studying in the in the in the session, and then the community talks two thirds of the time, interpreting the artwork, and then taking off in this conversation from the artwork to one of the topics of global citizenship. Like we study an artist called Fabiana Faleiros, her topic is pretty much like feminism and how to deconstruct the, the idea, like the, the modern idea of the female. And then like, so we look at her artwork and then the conversation evolves with the community to the topic of what's feminine is today, what defines the feminine. And, and that's very rich in a community where we have trans, we have black women, we have people from the North and the South, and the conversation is, is really like enlightening. One concern for me was that education usually uh, leverages on rational, on skills based on rational discourse on, on rhetoric and so I was thinking how can I reimagine education to include those who are perhaps not as eloquent or not perhaps as good at rhetoric but are very good at I don't know at conceptual intelligence or some sort of more kinesthetic or more imaginative or more like like a visionary or, or something and this has been beautiful in the, like in in class like we one of the artists we studied, which was on the subject of like uh, the dynamics of powers behind digital, like uh, social networks. And uh, this artist, Constant Dollar, he, he bought two and a half million uh, fake Instagram profiles and, and started doing some digital performance where he started like following people, like he put like 20,000 of his <laughs> fake profiles to follow somebody and then observe the impact this had on the, on the like if you, Put 20,000 followers in a politician, does it make him get more votes? If you put 20,000 followers in an artist, does it make him be purchased by, by collectors more? So he started to see what was the effect of, um, of, um, of digital performances on the, on, on the validation of the profile that was getting more followers. 
And then towards the end of the class, uh, I said, well, let's not now like forget our uh, rhetoric intelligence and let's try and pretend we are an artist and create an artwork on this, on this subject. And then one of the students who is a great musician and also great with images, and but sometimes very quiet in the corner. If it was like very rhetoric based, maybe he wouldn't have talked. Like he raised his hand and said, I would like to create an anti-social network where you start with a million followers and then a million friends, and then you have to unfriend them <laughs> towards finding the one friend that actually is worth having. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that, that was like so brilliant, like if we didn't have that step where we encouraged other thoughts of, of um, learning participation, that if it's only based on exams, only based on like words and like we wouldn't have these beautiful things. And sometimes I report these ideas to the artists and the artists love it because they, they create some sort of connection between the artists and the audience. I was somebody who suffered considerably at school and to the point where like one day I was in the eighth year, which I was uh, 14, three plus four, 15 more or less. And I came home to my dad and said, I'm going to stop studying and uh, I can't handle this school anymore. Like it's just the education is obsolete. The, the colleagues in classroom, they are just kind of uh, kind of limiting my, my my creativity and my identity and because I have to go to school in a certain way I have to take some classes that I think are obsolete I don't like the way like I was so critical and that was affecting me so much I was so unhappy that I said I'm going to stop and um, and most of my family was against but my dad said well do it it's like you know, there's no point of you being suffering and and then the director of the school was like going crazy if you stop school you like you're ruined in life you'll be a failure and then and then i challenged him and said well there's so many people who stopped and, and they're successful <laughs> And um, so I stopped for a year and my morale, like I became a little bit stronger and then, and then I went back and, um, and was less painful, but it's still very, very vivid, like very latent for, for me that the education that way wasn't, was like, a, wasn't working, it was, 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 making me less creative, less sensitive, less social, less connected to my heart, less, less like it was, it was actually <laughs> uneducating me. It was, it was <laughs> and then, and, and then, so then I went back for three years and then it was time to go to the university. I said, no, I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> so I didn't go to the university. And, um, and then was just now, like a few years ago, as a, as a grown up man, I was, I don't know, 35 or some 33, it was just like in my mid thirties that I said, well, actually in my friends, I started to study independently and like, I've always studied a lot independently. And one of my friends said, why don't you put it in an academic context? And I thought, well, because I don't like the academic context. And then I thought, well, maybe perhaps it's not as bad or I can get into it to reformulate and do something with it. And which is what happened. So I, I did my, my, my degree like as a grown-up man and finished my master's in uh, last December. Things, one thing that really caught my attention right from the beginning was, and, and this is something I've, was the form. You had a, a form that showed that you really thought through in a way I hadn't seen before the kind of the, the intake of participants and um, I think you had the options to donate something, donate or not to donate, or donate comes like a few questions about when to consider donating or not to consider donating. And um, so I thought it was really sensitive and really, and um, yeah, I have a friend who says, uh, Joan, the magic is in the doing. So one thing is for you to want to be inclusive. The other thing is for you to actually articulate a process that's inclusive and, and deliver that. And, and, um, and likewise, when you 
contacted me and saying like, look, as a participant, we look at your profile and we thought it would be interesting to hear a bit from you. And uh, I think that really stands out as a, as a practice. I think it's a no, uh, it's, well, no there's no precedent in, uh, of, of a conference that, um, that goes out of the way to, to listen to, to people who are in the audience. One of the res that reference for me that I, 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 I mention regularly is this uh, Boaventura Sousa Santos, is this author that has this concept of the university and the subversity, the pluriversity, where you like different concepts of universities. So when you see this like ecoversities, and when you see this idea of unlearning, learning and unlearning. We talk a lot about learning, but there's so much to unlearn. <laughs> there's, so, uh, <laughs> there's so much to unlearn. We had uh, one of my, this ladies who was in my class, who was one of the speakers in the conference. And uh, so that was was what made the connection initially. Like uh, one of my colleagues in the ARCA, the project I run, uh, said, you know, Deborah, like it's like involved with this ecoversity things, like you should. And then she invited me and I saw that form and that form like caught my attention straight away.